Hello and welcome everybody. We are extremely excited to welcome all of you to the inaugural symposium of the Telerobotic Surgery Leadership Council. We hope will be the beginning of a continued uh, and very important journey uh, toward the future of medicine involving telerobotics. We are honored to present uh, a two-part symposium. The first will be clinical uh, work presented by professors uh, Pedro Azagao in Lisbon, as well as Professor Carlo Poponi in Milan, where we will have the unique opportunity to watch them participate in each other's procedures. This will be followed by a discussion session led by uh, several members of Leadership Council. Uh, I would like to start off uh, with an introduction of Dr. and Professor Carlo Poponi, who is in the lab in Milan. And for the first procedure, we'll be presenting a patient with atrial fibrillation who will uh, be operated on uh, with the assistance of Professor Ajagao, who will be initially in his office uh, in Lisbon. Good morning to everybody. Good morning, uh, Dr. Weiss. The aim of this symposium is not to demonstrate uh, the efficacy or the method for the ablation of atrial fibrillation, but just to show uh, the potentiality of this technology to perform uh, remote mapping uh, and eventually remote ablation. He's a 62 years old gentleman. He's suffering from uh, episodes of uh, atrial fibrillation, relapsing and remitting, uh, refractory to several trials of antiarrhythmic drugs uh, with uh, propafenone and amiodarone. Um, uh, this is the standard 12 lead ECG during sinus rhythm, and this is the last. Uh, the last episode of atrial fibrillation uh, for which he was uh, admitted to our emergency room uh, in these days. Um, here you have the uh, transesophageal echo performed uh, today. You see by the, uh, by the video that the left appendage is quite free, uh, no smoke effects, as well as the uh, left chamber looks like pretty normal with uh, preserved ejection fraction and only trivial mitral regurgitation. So uh, this patient has been uh, today scheduled for this procedure. Professor Ajagao, did you find it reasonably easy to move the catheter when uh, you were doing the mapping? Not only, not only easy, even with the support of your technician, it works well. And uh, I think that uh, the voltage near the appendage always is a little, is a little bit higher, so it's the case. Uh, in fact, I would like to see if it could convert with the, the special right. uh, near the coronary signs.
And did you feel comfortable having Professor Paponi move the catheter during the ablation? Again, he was just working, he, in a sense, he was doing the, you know, manipulating the catheter like he would with mapping. However, ablation energy was turned on. So was there a comfort level there uh, with that catheter movement during ablation from afar? We were completely comfortable because uh, it, it placed the, the catheter nearby the area that we had identified. So for us, we are <laughs> completely convinced that he was right. This that is a wonderful great. experience. Today is an important day. Thanks, and I would like to uh, introduce everybody now to uh, David Fischel, the CEO of uh, Steratexas, who will be introducing the uh, discussion portion of, of today. Uh, again, I would like to remind everyone participating that there may be a discussion of off-label use of technology uh, in, uh, in technology that may not have yet passed regulatory approval uh, in various countries uh, around the world. Uh, David, uh, we will turn this over to you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you just joining, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural Telerobotic Surgery Symposium. Uh, we just completed the live broadcast of two long-distance robotic cardiac ablation procedures performed between Milan and Lisbon. This pioneering event was a powerful demonstration of the ability of robotics and connectivity technology to enable things that were very recently only dreams we could imagine. The reality is that telerobotic surgery is very much possible now. I want to thank Professor Roger Gao and Professor Paponi for demonstrating how this reality can be used for the betterment of patient care and the advancement of medicine. We structured today's symposium into two primary sections. The first was the live telerobotic procedures just performed. We are now entering the second section of the symposium. This section will consist of panel discussions designed to more clearly define what we mean when we use the term telerobotics and to more clearly delineate the benefits, opportunities, and challenges of the path ahead of us. Our panel discussions are organized around the three primary uses of telerobotics telerobotic support, telerobotic collaboration, and telerobotic surgery. Telerobotic support refers to the remote clinical, and if you can go to the next slide, please, Marlos. Telerobotic support refers to the remote clinical and technical support of operating rooms by industry. It is very much a reality and being performed on a daily basis at hospitals globally, but it's just at the beginning of its potential. Telerobotic collaboration refers to remote training, support, and proctoring between physicians to enhance procedure outcomes and medical education. Telerobotic surgery refers to the actual execution of long distance procedures using robotics and connectivity technology, as you have just seen. The reality is more of a spectrum than discrete categories, but these categories help structure our thinking and efforts. These are big topics to discuss. And so the goal today is less about delivering answers than about raising the right questions and seeding the ideas that can blossom and be refined in a series of subsequent conversations. The effort we are embarking on to fully realize the positive potential of telerobotics will be a multi-year journey that it will be a multi-year journey. There's a beautiful saying though, that while it's not our responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, we're not free to desist from it either. We are excited to be starting this journey and grateful to have you as partners in it. We have a distinguished panel of speakers that will be leading the discussion. Dr. David Burkhardt from St. David's Medical Center in Austin, Texas. Dr. Jim Chung from Wheel Cornell Medical Center in New York. Dr. Joe Delorfano from St. Francis Hospital in Connecticut. Dr. Ben D'Souza from Penn, Penn Presbyterian Medical Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Gabriel Latkou from Princess Grace Hospital in Monaco. Dr. Peter Weiss from Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Dr. Joseph Wu from Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles. Mr. Matt Dare, Research and Technology Coordinator at St. David's Medical Center in Texas. And Mr. Joe Mullings, CEO of Mullings Group in Florida. Now, just before we start, so we can have a better feeling for the audience, we have two short polling questions that we should show, that should show up on your screen now. Okay, so this is really kind of a, 
uh, a European and North American event. Uh, hopefully over time we can make it a far more global event. I think it probably reflects uh, to some extent uh, the penetration of robotics currently in the world. Um, uh, as Professor Paponi was describing though, a lot of the benefits of telemedicine uh, over the long term can actually be most impactful in, uh, in regions that, are, uh, that, that have less access to high, high quality medical care. Uh, but we'll discuss that in a moment. If you can please answer this question as well. Okay, very interesting. We have a broad set of, uh, of individuals who have answered uh, from different regions, though it seems like many of the attendees have not answered at all. So I guess we have a partial, uh, partial response list. Um, with that, let's, um, let's start off the discussions and I'll hand it off to, uh, to Mr. Joe Molings uh, to moderate the first discussion on telerobotic support. Awesome, thank you, really appreciate it, David. And uh, that was super exciting. Uh, I've been part of helping build Verb, Oris, Proximy, Corindus, Active Surgical, In Touch, and all of those have a virtual component to them, of course, or developing one. And being part of this today was very, very exciting, especially on this side of the uh, business, one of the firsts. Um, Dr. Paponi, Professor Paponi had mentioned words like working together, training people, accelerate and mentor, uh, and he also said, this is my procedure and I can share the procedure everywhere in the world. And the recognition of potentials were to go to avoid mistakes. And that was pretty profound to me. And I, and I, and I wanna toss this first to Peter, Peter Weiss, Dr. Peter Weiss. Um, what are the benefits and value? And let's start with the patients first. It's very clear physicians, but first with the patients, Peter, and then the hospitals who more than ever may need support from a telerobotic perspective. Sure, you know, clearly what we're all about is taking optimal care of our patients with regard to the safety and efficacy of our, our procedures. That needs to be done in an environment which is also optimized for uh, not just the patients, but also the operators and the healthcare systems that, uh, that they're working uh, within. Uh, I think that our professors are also uh, astute in, in pointing out repeatedly that while the technology, the, the hardware that is being used is important, it really is the expertise of the providers that provides the very special level uh, of care that will allow the patient care to be optimized. Uh, and that while the technology can be easily spread throughout the world, wherever there is uh, the ability to put it from a financial and regulatory perspective, it's really the special uh, skill set and understanding of the expert providers uh, that will make uh, the difference as things move to the next level. So to be able to provide that remotely uh, across the entire globe is really what uh, what becomes exciting uh, from that perspective. So uh, I think I think that really is the key. How do we uh, really expand our reach as uh, providers uh, to areas of the globe that don't have access to that level of, of expertise? Uh, and, and, and Dr. Burkhart, I believe you're on this panel with me as well. What are going to be some of the challenges and limitations that we might not be thinking of from the product development side? And this is where it happens a lot in the industry. The engineers and the marketing people believe they know what to put in the hands, but what should we be sensitive to from the clinician's perspective, what we might not be thinking about? Well, I think there's uh, a few issues, even some that we saw today in terms of there's definitely concern on who was controlling the generator, for example, the ablation generator. And I think that's one of the things that's going to be of concern in both the product and how do we, how do you manage to have the generator control on one side as well as the other side? What is the optimal safety as well as execution of that type of product? Uh, and I think that, uh, and you know, you're taking something that very that may be a very basic product that uh, that you have to control uh, remotely, and even the ablation products that we're using, something as simple as the uh, as the, the tubing and the pump uh, pump itself, and that if the uh, operator is remote from that site, 
uh, you still need someone there to be able to troubleshoot and, and operate uh, operate that. And I think that's one of the main issues that we have currently uh, that definitely needs to be uh, worked out as we go into the future. Joe, in particular, what are your, th what are your thoughts uh, from the industry side as far as the ability of industry to provide a higher level of support to their providers in the field through uh, tele, you know, tele information, telecommunication, uh, et cetera. What, what I've seen for the field support and some of the conversations occurring in, 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 the, in the engineering and the boardroom of these organizations is what we don't know once we move to a virtual environment is the things we take it for, for, uh, uh, for granted and the nuances that occur even from the use of language and head nods and uh, a head direction in another area. Uh, those can become critical until we understand that um, they may be, have far reaching implications uh, during surgery. So I'm curious is from, from the uh, physician and clinician's perspective, when do we figure that out? Do we figure that out real time? Do we get that experience shortly after we need it? So I, I, that, that's, those are my concerns in the telerobotic world is the beauty of not having to be in the room is also the liability. Matt, you, you, you've been plugged into this quite a bit, uh, obviously from a clinical side uh, and regulatory side and liability side. Uh, what what are you seeing when we think about things like virtual proctoring and teleproctoring and virtual training and team support uh, and over borders, not just state borders, but international borders? I, I think the the, uh, the kind of the first level that we've uh, run into where there's been, you know, issues uh, as far as discussing who who's in charge of what is just the individual facility with, you know, the individual vendor. So, you know, we've had, you know, it can take years in some instances to hash out some of these agreements between the local facilities and the vendors. The good thing is, especially with kind of, uh, at least in the U.S., where you kind of have the consolidation of care to larger and larger organizations like our organization I work with is HCA, so that once my facility was able to determine, and, you know, to finalize the agreement for both the business, business association and the actual technical security documents uh, with Jared Taxis in this instance, you know, they were able to use that as a template with the, with the other you know, 200 facilities within HCA. And so that's the nice thing where you, as you have kind of this consolidation model, it's smooth some of those, um, some of those water, you know, some of those issues out. Uh, because once you kind of pass that out once, people can use that to, you know, replicate what you've built elsewhere. Um, you know, it's been interesting. We actually is, uh, you know, we're talking about support here a little bit. One of the issues we've actually had recently, we actually had a technical problem with one of our uh, systems. And I can tell you, instead of having a week of downtime, we were able to isolate the problem, have a part there the next day and swap it out ourselves. So, you know, that actually we showed, we were actually have, able to have the, you know, the system up the following afternoon versus, you know, a week later, which is, you know, with the reality of COVID, unfortunately, you know, that would have delayed, you know, getting the appropriate field personnel from the company there. So that's just kind of like another example of where it's been especially useful, you know, in the current settings we have now, but that's probably not going to change in the near future. Really. So. Um, Dr. Joseph Delfrano, uh, the tools that a clinician becomes accustomed to using in his or her hand almost become intuitive. Uh, gee, I use intuitive in a telerobotic, interesting. So they almost become intuitive by nature. And when we start to move to a telerobotic environment, certainly the platform is going to drive many things. What about your concerns about interchangeability with a favorite tool in your hand uh, when it's being deployed or may not be able to be deployed on the telerobotic platform that's in control? And there's two aspects to that that I feel. <clears throat> First is, I, I do believe we need to move to an open platform because, for example, I may not use one mapping system yet there are some capabilities of one that I don't get with the other. And if I want to do telerobotic, then I'm kind of forced into using one of these platforms that maybe I'm not as comfortable with. There's a second aspect directly related to telesupport. And that is what happens when I'm doing a case and the 
company sends in a mapper that I've never met before <clears throat> or somebody that's not as skilled as who I'm used to. So there's a personnel issue. Now I'm, I'm dealing with somebody that I've never met, but with telesupport, it's possible to give me consistently the same person over and over again. And, and that to me is a, an interesting feature here. I can get a mapper to come in all, all, the, all the time with the same level of skill. And, and that mapper then becomes part of your team in a virtual environment. Yeah. Um, with virtual being a tool, do you then become more empowered to train more mappers because they can be virtual and you're no longer tied to your zip code or area code? Does that become a powerful tool for you? And does that open opportunities for better care for the patient if you're more comfortable with a better lineup of mappers? Yeah, that's actually an interesting thing I hadn't thought about. We talked about training other physicians, but actually training other technical support people um, across uh, the miles or the kilometers for Professor Paponi, then, then yes, uh, um, that, that, that's a very uh, interesting capability. So, so on, that, on that topic, I'd be kind of interested to asking many of the physicians, you might have industry reps that support you during your procedures that you're used to supporting. How often though do you have situations where different procedures might call upon different expertise that different reps have or don't have? And so how useful would it be to have not just one rep who might be your go-to uh, rep, but to have kind of a network of, uh, of support from industry where suddenly you come to a specific technical issue or a specific clinical issue um, or a navigation issue or a mapping issue that that local rep who typically is very good for you is not the ideal one at that setting and and they could then get kind of an additional higher level of support from a broader uh, broader kind of um, uh, network at, uh, of industry. I think that uh, that that's actually one of the strongest uh, portion of remote support actually is that you can concentrate a group, the best group of people in a, rem in a remote location to, to service. I mean, whether it's just actual service or support of the case. And so, you know, right now, just like you said, if you've got a person who's very good there, but there's something that they don't necessarily know or not the best that they have to call someone else. And that's, that's an issue as opposed to a remote uh, place. That person may actually have the guy, the next person sitting right next to them and be able to immediately get on that and address that issue and so in in cases like this actually uh, remote support and remote service uh, i think it is actually superior than on-site service in cases like that when we look at telerobotics oftentimes again we we, we focus on the platform itself uh, whether it's uh, the stereotaxis the core path platform the intuitive platform but we have to realize then that we've now opened up a pipeline for an accretive amount of data to put in the clinician and the team's hand, because we are now allowing that to open. And, and now what that does is drives potentially uh, Perel Gadot, who uh, uh, is uh, a leader of another uh, surgical robotic company out of the MedEx incubator. He uses a term called assist, advise, and automate. And that's going to be the progression of surgical robotics is assist meaning here, hold this or a master slave environment. But then when you start to get data, we can start to give advisement to the clinician real time based on the patient information loaded in and what's happening in the case. And almost in an AI suggesting that in 98% of the time, your peers did this in this environment. And then finally, potentially handing off some of the procedure in a full automation perspective, um, either it's opening or closing or whatever the, the uh, situation. I'd be curious to the, the three uh, docs here, what is your level of comfort in getting advisement in the middle of surgery that is counter to what you reflexively would do and then eventually hand off on an automation side of things? So. Uh, Peter, will you want to start us off on that one? Yeah, sure. I, I think it really takes a, a bit of a paradigm shift then in your thinking, right? Uh, from from the idea that uh, you're going to move forward with 
uh, your typical uh, protocol to opening up your mind to the idea that using that larger data set of experience uh, from from peers around the world would be would be appropriate in that setting. But but that being said, I think that's something we should very much be open to. Um, and there's no question that the large data uh, that could be uh, harnessed here uh, through AI and then in real time uh, brought into the lab with you virtually uh, could have tremendous uh, benefit to the patient. And, and uh, you know, I know we'll be talking some about the peer to peer support from that, but to have some of that come from the uh, industry side as well uh, makes perfect sense because it really is industry that actually has the uh, eyes and ears in every single lab using their technology, right? So more than anybody, they, the industry folks will actually know who's doing what and what has been done across the entire spectrum of users of their platform, right? While the individual providers won't really have that, that type of broad uh, vision into that. So I, I, think, I think that's absolutely key. Uh, and again, highlights how we need to further define the relationship be between industry and the providers uh, as we develop that, that process. David Burkhart, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we have moved into that already and that we see uh, in the mapping realm, automatic uh, mapping. Uh, what we see with it though, is more of just a concentration in the center, I think. And that uh, we, uh, we make the bell curve uh, more narrow and we see the limitations in, the, in this automated uh, realm but we still have these groups that are better than the automated uh, mapping. And but what we're really doing is dragging people to the, the right uh, in that case. So I, I do think that we are going to continue to to go in that, but we do have to recognize the limitation and that uh, still the, the super users of these uh, do tend to outperform the automated algorithms still. Dr. Del Prado? But it it also uh, depends on who's giving you the information. So again, getting back to my, to my um, technical support guy, if it's somebody that's really good at what they do, I, you know, we, we, already, we already work like that, right? We have a live mapper in the room who, who we trust to do a high density mapping um, and we're not even setting up the mapping setup. So we trust that their data is correct. Um, the, the, the other side of this is that, is that anything that can help to improve our outcomes, uh, including AI, um, uh, expert support, if we can show an improvement in outcomes, that puts our lab, for example, uh, ahead of the curve and, and gives us the ability to compete in, a, in, in our new value care paradigms that are coming down the pike, at least uh, hopefully soon. And then the, the automate side, when will a clinician be prepared to potentially go hands-free and let the surgical robot or the tele-robot do most of the driving as we do currently in our cars and in our airplanes that we put our children in, um, yet will we give up control on the table to a robot? The silence is deafening. Sure. <laughs> well, well, yeah. If it's a good robot, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't, that's the question. I don't have an auto driving car. So, yeah, that, well, that, that does beg the continued evolution of the integration between our, our uh, mapping systems and our navigation systems, uh, our relation system. But I think we are getting there. You know, we really have, you know, the, the legs of the, of the stool, so to speak, are, are coming together, uh, where we have rapidly improving integration between these different aspects. Uh, and once we have the system that we know can navigate to where we want to be, can deliver ablation lesions, it's being directed then by reliable mapping uh, that provides maybe not just uh, anatomical geographic location, but also uh, some information about tissue characteristics, et cetera, uh, that will really allow us to refine our, uh, our therapeutic delivery as well uh, in a reliable way. You know, I think that the goal of that makes absolute sense in that this is one of the few areas where human hands are still doing so much of the work uh, and that we've been unable at this point really to remove a lot of that human error from the procedure. So I think that the, you know, the Mars mission, the goal should be exactly that, right? Removing human error uh, and optimizing. Uh, and I think the pieces are coming together. I'll be curious to hear what our other panelists say about their, their thoughts on their comfort. 
I think what Professor Proponi did today was a great example of that. I noticed that he did the auto mapping for a vast majority of the ablation. Uh, and that's something uh, personally I haven't done too much, but I would love to hear Dr. Uh, Professor Proponi's uh, thoughts on how much of the control you give to the, uh, the computer system. Uh, from the beginning, uh, my intention was uh, to understand uh, how the machine uh, was thinking. And now I am, uh, uh, I am very expert to, to understand when the machine has difficulty because it's thinking differently from me and uh, I can uh, adjust the mouse and give some help to the machine. But most of the procedure is automatic procedure. I just add my brain to the machine because it's still very stupid. Uh, and I can predict uh, the difficulty of the machine to recognize anatomical obstacle or different uh, localization of the substrate. But I think uh, you already said everything about this new opportunity we have, but uh, we did not mention that is also an opportunity when uh, our air became white and we became more mentor, more less operator, but our know-how still preserve is value so we can prolong our professional life and uh, i think uh, this is a very important economical value of our professional history and dr paponi in regards to that you extending your professional career and thereby the ability to distribute and demonstrate more knowledge does that accelerate the newer people coming up and at what rate do you think, from your, your expert opinion, does that accelerate those uh, caregivers and, the, and those clinicians? As you said, it's very easy today to buy the new technology. It's very expensive to train the people to achieve a good level to operate the patients. So actually, the most expensive aspect of the welfare is the know-how and the competence. And even more, more, more difficult is to be expert in everything is coming up every day. This is the only way to accelerate, avoiding uh, long trip, uh, uh, flights, uh, uh, days lost in the, in the hotel. So we can do very, very easily. Today, we had uh, a very important experience and all together we are experiencing uh, a new way of thinking. I think everybody will be different after today. That is a perfect transition point. As we were talking about, again, the spectrum of capabilities that are enabled by uh, telerobotics uh, technology, the first really being telerobotic support, where industry can better support physicians as they treat patients using telemedicine. The second kind of step there is telerobotic collaboration. And you just were naturally flowing into that. And so I, I don't want to halt the conversation at all, but I just want to kind of uh, uh, notice that that was, that was how the conversation was evolving. And, um, and I want to also uh, introduce uh, Dr. D'Souza, who was going to, um, to kind of to say a few words more on that topic and, and moderate this aspect of the conversation. Yeah, thanks, David. So, um, you know, the, the concept moving forward us talk about um, physician to physician engagement, um, I think is really important. And hopefully we can spend some time discussing that during this forum. You know, when I graduated from fellowship, sort of the biggest concerns that I had were, you know, not so much how to move the catheter from one place to another. Um, but, you know, why would I do something or should I approach it this way? And having that physician to physician collaboration, depending on where you go into practice, um, is particularly important. And so unfortunately with, you know, COVID-19 and the pandemic and all the things that we have to deal with right now that we never had to deal with a few months ago, if I wanted to learn how to do something, I could go to one of the panelist labs, you know, in America or somewhere else in the world to learn how to do epicardial VT ablation or left atrial appendage closure. I can't really do that right now and, you know, and continue to be safe. And we can't let people in the hospitals the way that we, you know, previously did. So I'm interested to hear 
uh, what I think is a very important concept for us moving forward. How do we how do we train each other and continue to all get better without actually physically being in the same space? Um, and so I'm interested to hear um, all of your guys' opinions on this. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, we can start with uh, Pete. So what do you think um, in terms of how, how can we use our current technology to train each other? Uh, that's, that's absolutely key, uh, both as far as training each other uh, and helping each other in real time, potentially, uh, as well as training our trainees. Uh, and so, you know, I think that this will probably break down into a couple of different uh, one would be sort of real-time uh, participation in uh, collaborating with each other on a particular procedure at a particular moment in time. Uh, and, other, and then the second aspect will be a more broad uh, um, interaction with collaboration that wouldn't necessarily be focused on a particular procedure at a particular, particular time, but more uh, broad educational opportunities. Um, I know, Jim, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that uh, as well? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that this is just a unique opportunity. Obviously, the recent events put a lot of the focus on telemedicine, which focuses more on the patient-physician interaction. But here we talk about a, a key shift in how we think about the physician-physician um, you know, interaction. And Dr. Poponi clearly states, and we all know this, all the data show that experience matters, right? So the, the issue is that no matter what procedure you do, there's always going to be a learning curve. And this is a unique opportunity to basically shorten that ramp up uh, across the board with a lot of procedures. Um, and I think that um, this is sort of an inevitable thing. And in some ways, you know, with the recent events, it's kind of pushed the timeline on that. And, uh, and we all know that traveling for proctorship and observations are often limited uh, by ability to travel, by expense and all those issues. And I think this is low hanging fruit in terms of what we can do. Um, to basically no longer have to rely on a very small select group of experts who can do a lot of the procedures and basically allow that and more uh, uh, democratically, which is basically our goal. And, and I think it's, it's not, it's, it's really, if you think about it, pretty straightforward if you think about it in terms of doing um, collaboration this way. You know, that's actually something that um, I can speak to from at least our experience within the Kaiser system. Um, I know that we are a little bit different from the rest of the outside world since we're kind of a, you know, enclosed system. And there really isn't too much to do with the compensation of the positions. But how we leverage the Odyssey system is that if our individual physician is in a procedure and is in a tough spot or has a question, we can just call up one of our colleagues and that at this point is about 13, 14 different EPs in the Los Angeles area, five in the San Diego area, and about another seven up in the, in the San Francisco area. And they can just go on to their office computer, log on to Odyssey, and then look at all the signals and look at the interpretation, do the timing, and get that expert collaboration with actually multiple doctors, not just one doctor or two or three. You can actually have multiple people log on and have multiple eyes. Um, I think that's what Dr. Papone was saying is that it's the knowledge base that's really important, is that you need to have that ability to interpret those signals and know what to do next. The person moving the mouse or the catheter is almost secondary. You just have to actually understand the EP going on behind it. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that we currently do. And I, I think that's a great, great value of the system is allowing released remote viewing of the case. And if the next step would be remote man, uh, manipulation of the catheter and the, or the, the timing and, and the, or the recording system to do all of that. And uh, at, at this point, this is something that we do routinely here at our institution. So I, I really do think it is available to be done technically. Now, as for the other things that people are saying about how you work the compensation and the logistics of, of privileges, that's a little bit different. Here, we're, again, we're a little different. We're all kind of in one large group. But uh, I think that the technology is definitely there, and we are doing it currently in our system. I, I'd like to emphasize a little bit on those points, because I think there are two aspects of this remote collaboration. W one of it is, let's say, the very classical aspect of, of learning new things, how to do new things. And for those things, you still might to physically travel and to see entirely new technologies, things that you are not familiar with. But 
most of the times in, 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 in everyday life, what might be most useful is actually that know-how that you just emphasized on and, and we saw earlier from Professor Papon and Professor Adragao's cases. And uh, I, I cannot agree more with the fact that uh, we would so much value and many operators worldwide, I think they would so much value uh, in, in difficult cases, just a piece of advice from from a very experienced uh, operator and in order to go on and 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 in those those kinds of situations catheter manipulation and and controlling of the generate control of the generator and all those things are secondary and actually they, i wonder if they are not even a little bit dangerous because if you 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 give remote complete remote control to somebody else you might rely on that person a little bit too much and imagine in case of a complication, you still have to deal with it in your own lab physically, and you cannot rely anymore on, 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 the, on the remote uh, person. So once again, maybe, maybe that collaboration must be, uh, let's say, centered and emphasized mostly about that know-how transmission and, and, and advice for, for, for difficult situations. Can't agree more. Um. Do the rest of the panelists feel, are there any um, technological uh, or things that we think can facilitate um, overcoming some of the challenges in terms of access or, and again, you know, in terms of, and then we can also uh, uh, throw into that the, the business model for, uh, for this kind of a collaboration. Hey, Jim, yeah, that's the same thing when oh, you're sorry. talking because you know, it, it's common for me to like, get a text message and say, hey, can you call this person in the middle of their procedure or something like this, but I don't have access to a broader network of a cinema or some way of accessing uh, Ben's lab or, or Dave's lab, you know, uh, in a real ways. So I'd love to hear about uh, creating a network where we can actually log on remotely more universally in a HIPAA, you know, patient privacy compliant way yet provide that kind of, of resource. But you, you yeah, really just read my, read my mind because that was actually what I was going to bring up. You know, one of the issues you have is everybody loves this idea of being able to call a physician, have them log in and look at it, but how do you facilitate that in a way that is compliant both at the local levels, national levels, international levels? And, you know, when you start talking about that, when you're dealing within like a, like Dr. Wu's group where everybody's within the same practice, it's less of an issue. But when you're trying to reach out to physicians that are outside your facility, and don't have privileges in your hospital or you don't have VPN access to your hospital, you know, how do you manage that? And that's where, you know, building like a centralized access system, um, you know, like Odyssey or whatever, you know, whatever else it becomes, um, where at each facility, each facility only has to manage that relationship with that one or several entities that might be managing those other connections. And then they hand off that kind of authority to allow other physicians to have access to that with the local physician obviously having the ultimate, you know, ability to, you know, reject or deny, you know, allow or deny access to those remote physicians. So that's kind of one of the big issues when you're dealing with this is, you know, you don't want to have to have 20 different VPN accesses to, as, you know, Dr. Weiss or Dr. Wu or Dr. Burkhardt, if you're trying to help, you know, your colleagues that are at other, you know, within other systems, that just isn't uh, practical for anybody involved. The concept is really cool though, because I don't necessarily know when I'm going to get into trouble or, you know, obviously we know sometimes there's going to be a case that's going to be tough, but sometimes we don't know until we get in there. And unless I have other partners that are in the lab on that day, or I can get someone on the phone on that day, then I'm on my own. But if there was a way that I could ping, you know, hundreds of physicians out throughout the world and said, you know, what do you guys think about this? Or how would you approach this and get an, a response in real time? It'd be wonderful to have that for support, especially for folks who are out in solo practice or don't have that, you know, collaboration that we have at universities would be terrific. And I think that this VPN sounds like an appropriate way to start the process. And obviously, this is Matt had commented, the hardest part is really just a, a medical legal and a regulatory standpoint, not for the lack of wanting to participate. Or, or the technical, you know, the technical issues themselves aren't. aren't right, we good. already have it. We're doing it right yeah. now. So. Yeah, and it's funny because sometimes uh, on Twitter, every so often, you get the uh, e-peeps, you know, what you guys do with this case, which clearly, I'm sure, violates every uh, number of uh, <laughs> patient HIPAA rules or whatever. But, um, but clearly, this can be done 
I, I think it's, it can be done in a, in a thoughtful way with under the right regulatory uh, oversight. Um, it's, it's a no brainer, I think. And, and, and the bottom line is it's going to improve patient care, which is uh, critical. Do you see physicians taking sort of time out of their busy, uh, productive, uh, and lucrative days to uh, spend minutes helping others? Uh, you know, again, uh, it makes in Joe's situation where, you know, there's not that same sort of incentive, but the reality of, of, the, of how many of us practice, I think it will take a bit of a shift also in our, our mentality about that. I have a, I have a question for the, for the panel. Uh, starting from my uh, particular experience I had with the patient. Uh, I am uh, located in Milano and I received a call from uh, a family uh, having uh, a young woman in the hospital with uh, ventricular fibrillation in a rhythmic stone. And they sent me the EKG. And clearly the EKG was showing uh, the fascicular ventricular fibrillation, PVC inducing ventricular fibrillation. So if the patient was in, uh, in an advanced center, it was, was very easy to manage uh, this uh, arrhythmic stone, but it was in a city without experience and without center. So in that occasion, I decided to, to advise the family to come to Milano by airplane with the emergency team. So she came on the airplane to Milano during ventricular fibrillation. She received uh, probably 50 shock. And this is uh, well written in the newspaper in Italy. So uh, we did the ablation very easily. But if we have in the city a stereo taxi system, and uh, this woman can go there and I, we can do as expert the same procedure saving the patient. So I think we should we should consider also the importance of this application for the emergency when, when it's crucially important to have the know-how and the experience and uh, you know immediately what to do, but uh, the other people don't know where to go and what to do. So the patient died. Yeah, I know I think that's a really important point. I think that a lot of us still practice within the concept of that hub and spoke model, where you have a centralized source of quaternary in, uh, knowledge and, and experts, and then everyone comes into that central hub. But what if the spokes are hundreds of kilometers away that require an airplane? At that point in this situation, it can be really dicey of having a critically you know, ill patient trying to be transported to the hub is being able to kind of replicate some of these centers of excellence in the outside areas is, is something that's really advantageous. The sharing, of, the sharing of knowledge yeah. globally has been kind of one of the biggest accelerators of, of all progress, right, across society. Um, first with written books, the written word, uh, kind of more recently, obviously, with things like the internet. And so the way that we're sharing knowledge right now, despite all of us being kind of uh, distant from each other, to some extent, what we're talking about is trying to do the same in medicine, trying to connect labs, trying to connect the best brains who know how to treat a patient best, irrespective of ge the geographical boundaries. And, and I think this is sort of an excellent segue into the, the, the next section, which is taking it, you know, I think we all kind of agree here that collaboration uh, is, 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 is straightforward. Now the question is, how do we take the next steps? And Dr. Weiss can kind of uh, talk about how we may envision telerobotic surgery. Yeah, it's interesting as, as you were speaking, it, uh, an interesting aspect of what uh, Professor Proponi just brought up in that particular procedure. And, uh, and I think, uh, Joe, you'd, you'd mentioned some of our prior discussions, some other areas of medicine where we have more of a time sensitive component, for instance, stroke care, where there's already been some development of the model for, for doing this kind of thing uh, and the importance of it in a way that you really don't have time to get on an airplane, right? And you know, what, are your, what do you see from some of the other areas of medicine that have maybe moved ahead a little bit further in this already? 
Yeah, as an example, Peter, you know, we have Corindus where their, 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 their tagline is time equals brain, time equals heart. So in the instance where uh, time actually allows you to time travel when you have telerobotic telesurgery. And uh, you've got obviously a shortage of specialists, you've got a shortage of equipment, you've got a shortage of economics in centers of care. Um, and, and, you, and it doesn't necessarily mean geographic uh, location. Uh, Toland, who is the CEO, explained to me that if you're a rush hour in Queens, New York, you know, 7 million people, you are arguably three hours away from a stroke center. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's an argument to be made and a business model to be made. And I think you're going to see private equity firms and I think you're going to be venture capital firms setting up just like they did with LASIK in Japan, uh, setting up these telecenters um, where you'll be able to have uh, a, a great clinician like uh, Professor Paponi sitting in Milan in his uh, retirement years uh, after he hits a glass, or no, not before he has his Chianti, uh, uh, outsourced to uh, Queens, New York, saving lives or changing lives every day. And I, I think that's an inevitable business model that's going to uh, uh, occur. How do you answer the question, okay, well, there's not a, a stair taxis unit or, or a clinics unit in that other hospital at, at this point, and each of these is a million dollar capital investment. Uh, how do you get these other hospital uh, systems to buy into the idea that they should make that capital investment and then sort of farm out some of the expertise to somebody elsewhere? Well, the argument made was the initial fax machine. Nobody wanted to spend $400 in the first fax machine. But every time you added more fax machines to the value chain, the price came down, accessibility went up and outcomes improved in speed. So I, I think, you know, first you start with one and two is more than one. And then it's, a, and it's incumbent upon the stereotaxis and the corindices of the world um, to, to sort of think through uh, when does scale become powerful and maybe even become co-investors in these surgery centers. You know, there, there's, a, there's a myriad of models that declare themselves here. And uh, for instance, Joe, uh, within the uh, Kaiser system, how many stair taxi systems are there uh, throughout California, for instance? And is there any discussion then of, of moving more actively towards being able to interact in, in the actual procedures themselves? Again, you may, your system may provide a bit of a, a laboratory where uh, the structure of the system itself breaks down some of those barriers and, and lets us sort of see how this could work. Yeah, so um, at currently there's a stereotaxis system in Los Angeles. There's one up in San Francisco. Um, but it doesn't necessarily even have to be the entire magnet system, right? Because what Professor Propone was talking about is that it's more of the expertise, it's the knowledge. And just with the Odyssey system allows us to look at the signals. You know, like I don't necessarily have to take the mouse and move the catheter in, you know, Bakersfield in order to offer my knowledge to those physicians out there. It's that I can look at those signals. I can do the measurements. I can see the map and I can tell them, oh, go over here. Have you checked this? Have you done this maneuver? And so it's even not necessarily that, that, uh, that, that, um, that upfront cost of that huge magnet cost. It's just getting the Aussie system. It's, it's sharing that information, which is a much cheaper model than actually having the full system. But uh, did you see today during the PVC ablation, uh, the radio frequency was given by Pedro, but uh, we moved the catheter one millimeter at side of the previous ablation site. So import, I agree with you, is not important to ablate, but uh, sometimes the learning curve of using the technology is uh, very long to achieve a very precise point. So uh, we can uh, we can uh, accomplish also the needs to move the catheter on the ablation site. Why not? But only if it's necessary. I agree. But sometimes it's necessary, especially for the paraisian accessory pathway mid septal accessory pathway or uh, fascicular ventricular tachycardia uh, when the substrate is very small very localized very difficult to achieve so sometimes uh, it's necessary also to move the catheter 
Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, you're Professor Proponent, you're at a level that you're flying. The rest of us are still learning how to crawl. <laughs> so let us, you know, I think at, at some point we'll get to the, I, I hope at least with the regulatory systems that we have, can get to the point where that would be feasible. But establishing even just a review screen at this point that can cross interstate borders, um, that can get around those regulatory rules, I think that would be a huge first step. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting too, and, and sort of the other end of the spectrum then from an, a large organized system like Kaiser and uh, for instance, Dr. Delorfno, uh, you know, uh, you know, working in a, in a very different environment, how would this apply to, to your type of practice? Well, you, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we actually already heard this, that, uh, that um, uh, if I'm in the lab and my partners, you know, we're a small, small private practice group, so there's only three of us in, in one hospital. So if, if I'm having difficulty and my partner's seeing patients, he can quickly just log in, take a look, and move the catheter or vice versa. So that becomes very valuable for me because now what happens is he has to run down to the lab, leave his patients in the office, come and help me out or rescue me, and then, then come back. Um, and this is already being done. Dr. Paponi and Professor Paponi is doing this from home. Uh, but we can do it from the office, even in the same building on the same campus. And how about within the uh, HCA system, for instance, where, you know, between Matt and, and David, uh, you actually have the individual hospitals, but also the regions uh, working together and creating a larger electrophysiology network, I know. How do you foresee the role of, of this sort of collaboration uh, between, for instance, what goes on in Austin and then what goes on in, in Kansas City and, uh, and, and interaction there as well? I would like to tell you other thing uh, besides the remote uh, uh, evaluation. First thing is very easy to, to learn with stereotaxis. It's less risky than with manual lens. Uh, it's possible to, uh, to immediately try to move the cutter if you are trying to teach a person, you can inter have an intervention immediately without need to change the dresses, etc. Uh, the other thing is you, you may ask others, and this is possible if you are with Odyssey, and you may even have a system that you can treat in several labs that belongs to you at distance, so you can not to travel. This is true of the uh, to, uh, Papone. Uh, but I think that it's not only the remote mode, but it's the way to treat, and it's the way to the future, because we can have automatic treatments, and we can manage that at, uh, at the lab or at the office. But uh, it's the vision of, of the future. I don't know if the future is, is robotics or it will be an energy that cannot nail the, the, the vessels. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, we are trying to learn where to go. And uh, for, for instance, to treat at distance, not only in the earth, it's absolutely necessary to have this kind of robotic intervention. So if you have a person at a large distance, even not in the earth, it's possible that with robotics we can treat them. Like the pilot for the airplane, uh, we need the certification. And as you know, there are different level of competence in using uh, the robotics. At the beginning, uh, you learn after 50 cases, but uh, you understand that after 500, you are much better after a thousand uh, better, uh, and uh, you are today much better than 10 years ago. Uh, so the certification must be part, very important of the guidelines uh, in these issues. So we should, uh, we should develop uh, an algorithm for the certification of the people, because higher is the certification, more safe is the procedure. And uh, for instance, uh, Matt uh, or David, you know, within a large system like HCA, but with its individual regions, do you see then that sort of certification being uh, created to help the other physicians within your larger network uh, get on board and become participants in this? Well, I know Dr. Burkhart can speak to this a little bit more, but, you know, in our area, we have, you know, just with an HCA, you have different credentialing practices at individual hospitals. And then you have to be credentialed, but, you know, theoretically at this time would have to be credentialed on both ends, both in the state you're practicing from and potentially the state 
that the patient's in. So we'd have to completely rethink that to where you have a much more streamlined both credentialing and licensing. So that's, you're, you're talking a couple different levels of uh, regulatory changes, both, you know, at the governmental and facility level. So after, I can... you know, I would say this is very important to HCA. Uh, they, uh, they have been trying to create a model of where you have a center of excellence and how do you recreate that? within the system at another location. Because you know, in the past, the, what they've thought is, oh, well, we just hire an electrophysiologist for this remote place and it's gonna happen. And it, and it doesn't happen. And so they're definitely changing to, well, we're gonna let you know this, we're gonna put you in charge of this remote location. You hire that person, that person gets involved in your group and that has been a successful operation in terms of HCA. And we, the way that we improve upon that is something like this in, in terms of the, the tele-collaboration and, and tele-support. So uh, industry uh, and hospitals and the money is all going that way. And uh, you know, Jim, I, I'm thinking about academics as well and your interaction with your trainees, your fellows, uh, and not only when they're in their training, uh, being able to help them learn during particular cases, if you're somewhere else in the hospital, et cetera, but then also when they go off into practice elsewhere and a continued longer term mentorship uh, as well. As uh, Professor Pony mentioned, of course, all of us, uh, when we get done with training are nowhere near ready to be actual competent, excellent providers, right? So what, how do you foresee the contribution there? Yeah, it's, it's actually a great question because we just had our graduation on Wednesday and they're already starting to, you can see the fear in their eyes because uh, they, they're going to be out there. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, the beauty of, um, I think the robotic system is it makes the, the training aspect very, very straightforward uh, uh, because from practically the first or second case, they, they're, you're sitting right next to them. And I think again, with, with the idea of tele collaboration, you don't even have to be physically there, um, and and it, it makes it very straightforward. And I think it, it, it again can foster that relationship. The nice thing is that all our fellows always check in with us, even years after they've graduated. But especially in that first, you know, few months period, or they may be taking a month or so off in between jobs, and then they feel a little rusty, and that that's a time when they feel like they may need a, uh, extra guidance. I think it, it, um, it, it helps facilitate that. But I think that the robotic system, you know, we've been able to incorporate that very well into our training curriculum um, just by virtue of the technology being very conducive to that. And one thing, I, okay. I one thing I want to add on top of that is that with the Odyssey system and especially with cinema, what we actually do is that we simulcast every single one of our procedures so and put it on a HIPAA compliant teleconferencing. So we actually broadcast every single one of our procedures that trainees, uh, other EPs, even referring cardiologists can log on and watch our cases live time. Uh, and I think that really goes to like say that if you have, if you have someone that's like oh I haven't done a parahistian you know pathway in a long time well we've got one coming up you just log on watch us do it and then you can have the ability to call in ask us questions and we can kind of walk you through it to how we're doing it what our our techniques and things are like that and we do that with almost every single one of our cases in the lab we using the technology of these telecommunication teleconferencing uh, programs and Odyssey and Cinema. Very interesting. Yeah, and that that's a huge opportunity, and I think it, that you guys have uh, evolved beyond many of us in that way, uh, and as a model for that. And then and I was going to ask Jim too, is even thinking about the next generation, of course, right? And uh, those of us with, with more gray hair uh, who are getting involved with all this, but uh, do you find also that your trainees are gravitating towards jobs that have these sort of technologies? That there's a, a sincere interest uh, in that younger generation in, in pursuing this as they come from more of a digital age than, than we did. Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, I think uh, uh, they are looking out there to, to see if this platform is available at their new, you know, at their new jobs. And, uh, um, and again, yeah, for the younger generation, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, uh, 
you know, it, it, it really is conducive in terms of the manipulation and everything. And, and, the, and the nice thing about this technology is it doesn't supplant the conventional, you know, uh, uh, way of doing procedures. So uh, I think the anatomically difficult areas that you may encounter with robotics are the same ones that you may have issues with using manual ablation and vice versa. They're not that different, but the sense of anatomy, I think, uh, uh, importance of knowing your anatomy is also uh, uh, critically important. And if anything, the stress of not make, you know, knowing that you know, you're, you're less likely to perforate or less likely to get into trouble in certain situations does uh, uh, give, take a little bit of stress level down and give you time to kind of take your time, get that point by point complete voltage map and things like that for the RV and the LV. Um, so I think it you know, works very nicely. And I also even wonder about just the psychological predisposition of the younger providers being more used to interacting with each other and social media uh, in a network type approach uh, using these technologies where many of us were trained in, a, in an era where you become the individual warrior, right? And, uh, you know, each of us responsible for that procedure and we're the king of, of that room in that, in that time without really regard for, for the outside so much, where I, I think, again, there may be more of an acceptance and actually an appreciation for being able to share that experience in a larger way and, and get some of the benefits of, benefits of that in the younger generation uh, as well. Um, yeah, Pete, it's, it's an interesting concept because um, depending on where you train for fellowship, you know, the normal tradition, just like Jim had said, is that if I graduated from HUP from Penn and then I had an issue, I would call one of my former mentors, one of the former docs or one of the fellows who had graduated above me. But if you train in a program where there's not that many people, um, you might not have as big of a network. And I don't, you know, that's not necessarily fair to, you know, folks depending on where they go. And you may not feel comfortable asking your partners depending on, you know, especially when you're early out of fellowship just for whatever reason. So to establish sort of a, a network where everyone can support each other and be collaborative without that concern for I don't know what I'm doing or I you know I don't feel comfortable with this quite yet is particularly important and would be you know wonderful for, to be able to set up and the, the, we sort of already have a lot of the tools to be able to do that and you know Twitter and there's other you know social media environments that already do that to some extent but not to the level that we could provide if we really wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I think that provides a, a perfect then uh, opportunity to, to transition to the next part of the conversation with, with Dr. Lactu, because how do we actually operationalize this, right? You know, what, what are some of the early steps that we could take to uh, create an organized path forward? Uh, is there other research projects that we should focus on uh, as, as a group and the other people involved uh, with this? Uh, with, yeah, what, do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, all of you. I think it's a, it's a great discussion we are having here and it's hopefully, changing our way to, to, to work in, in our field. Let, let, let's try to be for this last 20 minutes very practical and I will uh, specifically address some questions but uh, all the panelists are, are, are invited to, to, to give their opinion and first of all let's talk again about the support and, and remote support and uh, the, the idea was brought by, by Dr. Burkhardt I think that maybe, maybe choosing the, the support person would be one of the potential advantages of creating a, um, a remote support. And you can rely on the same person uh, or, or a small network of persons, which are uh, maybe the best professionals in the field uh, that you could rely on. So is this the best model? Uh, and if it is, I just want to, 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 to make you think that we are, in everyday life, we, we all experience call centers. All banks have call centers, phone companies have call centers, and we, we, we call them from time to time. And some of these experiences are good, but some are not good. And um, so, so once again, if we are to migrate toward such a, a remote support system, uh, how should we act in order to have the best one? They, they, are, they are supposed to support us in, in, in uh, let's say, life, critical life situation uh, for, for our patients. So, so Dr. Burkhardt, can you comment but, on that? Yeah, I think, I think what you brought up regarding the, you know, the telephone support that we have right now is actually an excellent 
example. I mean, that what are the limitations of that? And the limitations are most of the time it's difficult to get to the person who can actually help you. And so you just get a random person there. Uh, the other is um, th it's not necessarily an expert in, in, and it's difficult to even get through that process. And so I think for, for remote support specifically, what you need is your number or whatever you go to that site, you need to immediately get to an expert. And if they don't happen to be the expert that you need, they can immediately get you to the next person. And so you're right, we can't fall into the trap of what telephone support has become. And you just get someone who's paid $8 an hour to click on a computer and see what is the and read back what the computer says. We, we definitely have to do better than that. Okay. A any other comments on that? Yeah, I, yeah, got, I got a comment. It's Joe Mullings. So historically, surgery and especially on the EP side has been as much art as it is science. One of the interesting things that surgical robotics and, 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 and remote robotics do is allows us to have retrospective information because we can, we can record that entire procedure. We can then have a game tape and digitize and add value to the procedure. We could then grade the, the procedure and share and democratize it for learning. And so one of the things that's coming out is that there can be, again, the acceleration of using that retrospective experience because it's now being recorded and we can assign and critique it in a positive fashion. I think that has to be embraced earlier than later in order to compound the effect of this telerobotic opportunity. Curious on the thoughts in the, on the panelists on that. I mean, because it's a judgment and it's a radical candor on how things are being done. So, so, so is it the responsibility of us physicians to put, to put, let's say, some pressure on the industry to create those remote support networks, which should stay the highest quality possible, or, or should we just trust them and, and let, 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 let industry assume that, that, that role from the very beginning? From Sarah Taxis's point of view, I can say that you don't need to push to some extent what you're doing is you're encouraging us. Right? Yeah. We, we can sense it and that's why already there's a few dozen, about 30 or so Stereotexas team members who are supporting now procedures in a telerobotic fashion at uh, nearly 100 hospitals around the globe. But, but sure, this, this level of support and the way that it is executed and the ability for you to ask for support uh, from this network can obviously be refined. And so this is a fascinating discussion which is helping this refinement. You, you are clearly the model to be to, to, to be followed, but let, let, let's go beyond support and, 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 and talk once again about collaboration. And we, we talked about the, the, the support of experts and how important the know-how is. And, uh, and Dr. Souza and Dr. Chung brought up the idea that maybe a, a, a network of supporting physicians could be the right solution for that type of, of situations. But I think that from for that aspect, the difficulty will be the availability of, of, of the physicians, of the expert physicians. Uh, so how, how practically, how should we, let's say, put this up? Uh, is, is, should, be, should this be, let's say, industry-based, like uh, every mapping system should design, should have its own a network of experts, actually they already do, but should, should they put up, a, let's say, an availability program in order to remotely collaborate with, with the centers that might need some, some remote device? Is that the right solution to go? Or, 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 or is it something which should be more independent? Uh, okay. So yeah. please g g give us our that's, thoughts. Yeah, that's a great, and I think one of the, I think one of our attendees asked the same question of, Look, EPs are busy, right? I mean, who can take the time to be available at all times to answer this? The question is, do you have a pool of people who, uh, and if there's sufficient people in that pool that at, you know, at any random time, there are, is gonna be someone who's gonna be available. But if there is that pool, um, how is that gonna be maintained? 
uh, uh, what's the incentive necessarily for the people who have valuable time and limited time to do these things. And, and I think industry may, you know, may play an important role in this uh, because uh, uh, of the time and, 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 and financial impact of being kind of on standby. Um, and I think that that's, that's a great discussion. And, but then it would, at the same time, I also get your point, it'd be great to also have an, a separate uh, independent group. And that's where, I don't know, do professional societies, does the Heart Rhythm Society play a role in maintaining this? And I mean, uh, at this moment, it sounds a little outlandish, but at the same time, it's, it's, this is the way of the future. I feel like a lot of this discussion we have may seem a little bit out there, but it's, it is like here. I think it's inevitable that we have this discussion and we have to face uh, some of the beauty of technology that allows us to have access and have to then deal with how do we reconcile um, the logistical aspects and financial aspects and all that with what's already totally available from a technical standpoint. And, and Ben, I'll open it up. Yeah, the traditional way to do it, it I think is very easy to have done. So, you know, if I have a perihisian PVC that I'm concerned about that's scheduled for Tuesday, I can go through, you know, a network of physicians and say, Pete, are you available, you know, Tuesday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to help me with this case? And then they budget that time and then we do it together. That, I think, is sort of the way we do things now, just with, you know, robotic or tele, I should say, telerobotic support. The harder way to do it is in live sort of fashion, where that if I do need help or anyone needs help, how can they acutely go out to somebody that is a pool of people that are available that get pinged on their phone or something like that and said, if this person is available at that time, you know, can they, can they quickly log in via computer or a tablet or their phone and, and try to, to, you know, navigate or help me through something difficult that does not currently exist. Uh, and so, I think that if we can somehow develop that network would be wonderful. And yes, I think the grand scheme of having a social media type platform of people that are, you know, think sort of similarly in terms of collaboration and support would be great. And it's an easy way to foster research publications and, and sort of other things moving forward for collaboration that goes outside of the normal realm of how we do things, which is either collaborate within your own institution, collaborate with people you've worked with in other ways, um, or something that is industry sponsored that is more sort of global and, and free flowing. In a, sense, in a sense, it breaks down uh, into sort of two different scenarios, right? We have the uh, right now interaction on a particular patient on a particular procedure at that particular time, uh, which we've been talking about uh, the idea of creating this collaborative group that can be reached out to. And then we also have uh, what Joe, I think was alluding to, which is a, a broader ability to standardize and remove some of the variability in our procedures in healthcare overall by leveraging the incredible amount of data that would be derived from putting all of our experience together, right? You know, not, not in real time, but in, in retrospective analysis of the technical information. You know, I, I think we're all probably aware of the fact that, uh, you know, Steratexas, if they wanted, could pull up any particular procedure and actually go back and see every single movement of the vector. Okay, I mean they actually know our average, you know, rel you know our average uh, how many degrees each, had, each vector movement is on average. We did this in procedures, this and that. I mean that data could all be also put together and analyzed uh, with modern big data techniques to try and optimize, uh, reduce variability in, in the work that we do uh, as well. So I, I kind of in my mind are thinking about these two different aspects of it: the the real time collaboration and then the larger scale uh, moving forward of our profession in general towards reducing variability and sharing the expertise. And Peter, that's an important point. When we talk about collaboration, a lot of times we've been referring through this conversation about real time collaboration. Well, what if you could take Professor Paponi's experiences on the stereotaxis machine, as he said, he's learning the machine if we can watch what he does, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm three years into this, well, that's collaboration. It's just an absence of Professor Paponi in person, but I can learn and, and see what he did in this scenario. And actually that goes back to the advisement insight I gave is, what if it came up on the screen and said the top 
five percent of, of clinicians at this point did this. Uh, you make the choice, but here's the advisement we're giving you. That's collaboration. It just happens to be non-real time and and uh, an aggregation of outcomes. So that. I think it's important to keep collaboration in mind beyond real time, which is what we default to. Well, Joe, what you just described is actually real time also, just in a different way. So I, I love what you just said, because this is actually real time uh, help, but not by a human being. It's real time help by the actual putting together of all the experiences of all the human beings. Correct. Right? And I think that that's a very interesting aspect where we might be able to tie these uh, together. What kind of... What kind of practice, you know, Dr. Lack, do you think there's a couple of areas where we could move forward right now? Are there a couple research study designs that can be done to begin to prove that some of this actually might be of value? Uh, difficult to say at this point in time, but because even, even the, the available solutions are, are still, from my point of view, a question mark. I mean, if I need a, if I need a certain collaborator for one specific thing. I, I, I wouldn't even know what to advise him or what, what does he need to, to connect to my Odyssey system? I mean, D David, you may, you may answer. Uh, and beyond that, what are, what are the other commercial solutions already available on, 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 top, of, on, on top of Odyssey? Uh, so m maybe, maybe one, once we put up all this uh, practical path, Mm, and and everything is available. We should we should we. I, I think our our imagination has 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 no limits afterwards. But is it really possible today outside the very a prepared scenario like 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 the one we saw today? And let me ask. There's a very one of the big challenges from a technical perspective is that if you just pick up your iPhone and show your screen, to some extent you can do it like you're doing today. But when you, if it's just, and you take away kind of remote control, you just do kind of viewing, collaboration without any mouse control. The, the challenge in electrophysiology is that you have very fine ECGs and you have fine kind of details uh, on the screen that need to be assessed in a high quality without a significant latency. So the question is, is my guess is that just putting up an iPhone doesn't actually work in practice because you can't share that type of quality of image. So you need the ability, and, and that's where it would be interesting to ask what, what aspects of the screen are most important for you? Is the ECG of kind of high, highest importance where then that type of quality and latency has to be addressed very well, which currently, as you see with the Odyssey Cinema solution, we're able to accomplish that, but to make it broadly accessible while still maintaining that type of quality, that then is a technical challenge. Yeah, we, uh, I think we, we may focus on specific details on, on the screen and I, I don't really feel that that will be the limit. Maybe, once again, maybe, maybe the, the, the availability of the person on the other side, it, it will still be the, the, the most important one. But, and, and we, we talked also about telerobotic procedures and once again, we saw very beautiful examples in the procedures done in Milan and, and, and Lisbon today. But how do, do you really think that this is translatable in the, in the real world? I mean, EP requires a very, let's say, difficult to put up infrastructure. And in the, in the, in the Professor Paponi's example with the, with the patient having ventricular fibrillation, the, the truck would, wouldn't get there in time to perform remotely the procedure. The, 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 the infrastructure is very, very heavy to put up. So uh, I, I, I am not sure that remote procedure is, is, is really the, the, what we are going to value most from, 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 from a tele-EP in the in the in 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 the near future, I I I, I very much much liked the, the proposition from which came from from uh, Dr. Uh, Delorfano about about uh, colleagues in the same team uh, having let's say that small uh, tele infrastructure and helping each other for uh, let's say scheduled cases. Uh, what what are the the thoughts of the panelists about about tele procedures in the near future? 
I think you're going to see, I'm, I'm not a clinician, but I think we've seen things like when the Wright brothers in 1903 were in Kitty Hawk, nobody could ever extrapolate out commercial airliners carrying millions of people a day and that infrastructure that would be required around that. Uh, I don't think we'd see when we first saw in 69 Armstrong walk on the moon, uh, a private sector in Tesla, uh, and I say Tesla on purpose, putting uh, cargo on the uh, American, uh, 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 on, on, on the space station. So look, it, there's a first step. There's, at least it's a first step. And then I think we should, we should all grab a beer in 10 years and replay this tape. And, and it's a legitimate question you have. And I think we may in fact giggle at it uh, on how small thinking we might have been um, by it not being the, the, the norm. So that's what I would throw at this. It's inevitable. It's, it's just inevitable. It's how do we get people like David and his team to keep on being brave enough to be a pioneer in that and, and, and the clinicians like you to have the, the courage to continue to say, no, 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 uh, this is the way. So look, let's, let's get together in five years and replay this tape in Milan. I think uh, Professor Paponi will put the wine on the table. Well, I, I think, I think like in a lot of areas of technology, you know, the technology is running well ahead of both our comprehension of what we could really use it for, but then also, you know, the legal and regulatory environment around that. And so that's, that's going to require people in leadership like the panelists here, you know, pushing both their facility, their state government, their federal government, you know, to be able to build that, that legislation and those guidelines to allow this technology to move at the pace it's capable of moving at, you know, in a way that's safe and practical, that everybody's comfortable with from a legal perspective. I mean, that's, it's like everything else. Like, like look, at, look at some of the struggles, you know, Tesla, you mentioned Tesla, but look at the issues they've had from a re regulatory standpoint with their, you know, their autopilot system. I mean, that's been, a, you know, regulatory nightmare for them. You know, so you have to be able to, you know, have, have people in key leadership positions within the field that are willing to put in the time and effort into making, the, you know, pushing for those change, those regulatory and governmental changes to make sure that, you know, that can keep up with the technology to allow us to, to, to not slow us down from doing what we need to do. Yeah, and David, you should have people uh, like Scott Whitaker from AdvaMed attending this. You should have people out of MDIC uh, attending this who are pushing innovative technologies. They should all be part of this grassroots uh, initiative in addition to the people and, on the and that is while stereotaxis initiated this conversation and, and tried to bring kind of this this fantastic panel together if you if you pay attention we called it the telerobotic surgery leadership council and we kept it very broad in that because the whole goal is that what you guys are starting today to some extent if an intuitive of the world or a mako of the world or a corindus of the world wants to join this discussion and to elevate it and to make it a broader effort, that would be a fantastic next step. And so we do feel that this is sure, this is a broad, a, uh, an effort that is much broader than just electrophysiology. And it will take, it will take, there's gonna be many paths that need to be pushed forward in parallel to really uh, accomplish the full potential, but we can make steps that are practical steps now. And so as uh, the quote I mentioned in the introduction, you uh, you don't have to finish the process of repairing the world and making it better. You have to start, and so each one of us is taking our steps to start it. I would like to to add something. This is the moment to think big, and uh, nobody knows the limit of our dream. But uh, it's better to discover the limit uh, as late as possible. In the meantime, it's important the sentence that usually is used in the jumping horses. To, to ride your horse is important that your horse don't know his limit. We don't know our limit, so now we, have, we can freely jumping uh, and to, to start uh, the new approach uh, to our clinical practice. Right. I think I think that makes perfect sense and and really points to the importance of this initial gathering uh, as a jumping off point for what might be discussed in the future. And, you know, I think thinking big is obviously going to be very key. Uh, but I mean, everybody's got their own analogies. You know, I like the very simple one that I talked about with my kids about how you eat an elephant. Right. So, you know, you take the first bite. OK. And uh, 
then you make your way through. And so, you know, I think that because one thing we haven't gotten too far on yet is, you know, are there some very practical things we could do today to start building a bit of body of evidence that would then allow Matt to think, uh, you know, more broadly about the regulatory issues to begin to show the FDA and others that there's actually some value in this. You know, should we go ahead and start designing now some, some simple but very focused research studies to begin to create some evidence for this? Uh, should we explore some of uh, Joe's ideas of using some of the bigger data and ask David uh, to have his folks go through some of their database and, and see, okay, are there some uh, tools that could be created to help uh, provide some uh, remote support there? Uh, can we help you know, Jim work with his uh, fellows network? Can we help uh, Ben uh, reach out through the Penn network, but also uh, help uh, Dr. Delano in his uh, smaller practice uh, and can we look to, to Joe and, and Kaiser, for instance, as a model of how this, these things can be spread throughout a, a system? So I think this is really the a place where we have begun to ask the questions. Uh, the questions will, of course, multiply, but hopefully also become more focused over time uh, and then lead us to then what are the pathways for starting to get some answers? Because obviously there was nothing about today that was meant to create answers, right? today was about beginning to think in a big terms and then also to give us some direction uh, going forward. And uh, you know, I think as our, as our time runs out uh, here, I, I want to thank everybody for their participation uh, today, uh, especially of course, Derek Axis for sponsoring this, uh, for uh, Professors Adjagao and Poponi uh, in sharing their procedures with us, uh, for the expertise of everybody involved. Again, I think it's, it's terrific that we also in, involved physicians from all over the world, physicians from all different practice backgrounds, uh, uh, as well as some non-physicians like uh, Joe and Matt as well to, to share their expertise. And uh, you know, I think going forward, uh, this should be viewed as a beginning uh, and certainly not any, any kind of end. So we would also invite all of the participants uh, in the audience, as well as those who spoke, uh, to look forward to follow up uh, communication uh, from this group uh, to potentially ask if people would be interested or willing to participate. I don't know if you wanted to put up a, there was a, a poll, I guess, at the end here, uh, just to gauge people's interest in participating in working groups going forward uh, as we begin to develop the thoughts around this uh, further uh, in each of these areas. Um, I don't know if uh, we want to put up that poll and get some answers before we, before we leave today. So uh, we will send you a survey after this webinar so that you okay. have time to uh, think in which group you would fi uh, fit in best. Um, so this will come right after the webinar. And, and, let me just, um, and let me just make one final just thank you to all of the panelists. Um, kind of really, this was uh, fantastic. Uh, also to all the fathers on the line. Um, uh, happy Father's Day tomorrow. Um, and, and I think there are very practical things that can be done. And so the polling question that will come up in a moment is, is to ask uh, those of you who are listening, if you are interested in joining working groups, we, this is again, the start of the conversation. Um, apart from kind of those conversations, Stereo Texas does have, um, at, if you have a robotic lab, we do provide support uh, remotely. We would love to do more of it and we'd love to learn from that effort. So it's, both to actually provide day-to-day -day support of your procedures, but also to learn from you the feedback on how that can be improved, how we can do better. And if there's any collaborative networks that do want to be set up between sites, we would be delighted to work with you to set up those collaborative networks. Again, that is something that is possible now between robotic labs, and, and we're delighted to, to make those connections as part of this exploratory process. Thank you very much, everybody. And we will uh, very much look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. Uh, did you want to do an actual poll here or it'll be involved with the email afterwards? Is that correct? We agreed to do that um, afterwards so people can Okay, see. very good. And let everybody go back to their lives. But again, thank you so, so much for all of our participants, all of our attendees. Really a fascinating and enlightening discussion and a platform for, for the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Take care. Be safe.